Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for service today. This is Pastor Rocket. I just wanted to give you a brief announcement to let you know that we had a technical issue with the camera during today's message, so the audio from the full message will be there if you continue watching, but there is a point where the camera stops working and there's no longer video, so I apologize for that. Just wanted to let you know ahead of time, so it's not your computer, not a problem. It's a glitch we had on our end, but we're continuing to post the message for you, so I hope you'll enjoy what God had for us today, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm Pastor Rocket, and I'm glad you're here with me. The Lord has a message for us this morning. If you're taking notes and you like titles, this message is entitled, Come Have Your Way, Part One. I realized in studying and in reading and in praying and in assembling this, this was not a one-part message. It was at least going to be two, because I realized I had barely gotten past the introduction and I was on page three of my notes. And usually when I write notes for a message on Sunday, it's about five pages long. So if I had written part one and part two after the introduction was three pages, we would be having church longer than any of you could bear. <laughs> Except Kathy. <laughs> I know Kathy hangs with us. I did not feel led of the Lord to cram all of this into one message, so we'll have a second part to this next week. This week, Come Have Your Way, part one. We're going to be reading out of Judges chapter six. I'm going to read to you the first 10 verses this morning, Judges chapter six, verses one through 10. Some of you get very excited and other of you become very nervous and some of you seem very bored and tuned out immediately when I say we're going to teach out of the Old Testament. The message comes out of the Old Testament. There's some history here that we can't ignore. There's some foundation. People wonder, well, if we're under grace, why do we have to worry about this? Because we need to understand what was happening in the law and we need to understand what grace saved us from and we need to understand how the law still applies Grace is simply the exception for the consequence. It doesn't mean the law doesn't exist. That's for free this morning. I hope you've had time to find Judges chapter 6. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. I know you're all shocked. If you've read the Old Testament, I'm sure that's the most shocking thing I'll say to you today. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years, and they oppressed Israel. Because of Midian, the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, Amechalites, and Quimidites, that's what I'm going with, came and attacked them. They encamped against them and destroyed the produce of the land even as far as Gaza. They left nothing for Israel to eat as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For the Midianites came with their cattle and their tents like a great swarm of locusts. They and their camels were without number, and they entered the land to waste it. So Israel became poverty-stricken because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord. When the Israelites cried out to him because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to them, and he said to them, This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt and out of a place of slavery. I delivered you from the power of Egypt and the power of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am Yahweh your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites whose land you live in, but you did not obey me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time this morning. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word, and I pray that you will honor your promise that it won't return void this morning. Be with us as we hear it. Settle it in our hearts. God, give me the spirit to speak it today in the way it needs to be spoken. Let this message hit home with your people. Let it resonate with them so that it will bring them into alignment with you. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're talking about Israel. Israel, let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. When we're talking about the Old Testament is God's chosen people. In the New Testament, the children of God and those who follow Christ and who have accepted Jesus for who he is, we are God's chosen people. When God is speaking a message in the Old Testament to Israel, we can just as easily apply it to ourselves today because we're that people. Whether we're applying it to our current situation or whether it looks like a situation we've been through, as human beings, our lives have looked very much like the nation of Israel. And we can draw parallels and see obvious things that have happened in the Old Testament with God's chosen people that continue to happen with God's chosen people today for much the same reason as they happened with his people because people are people and we behave the same way whether it was 4,000 years ago or four hours ago. We're still human beings trying to follow after God. We make the same mistakes and we have the same consequences apart from grace that we have in the New Testament as we saw with these folks. People are people, okay? 
Something that Israel failed to realize that we also have to realize this morning is that the ultimate goal of our relationship with Christ is to serve him in this life. The ultimate goal of our relationship with Christ is to serve him in this life. Not to live my best life, not to find out what my ministry or calling is, not to be a better person, not to achieve a goal, not to acquire any sort of personal benefit whatsoever. God is not a vehicle by which I can benefit in this life, period. The only promise he made me was grace so that I would spend eternity with him. I'm not entitled to, in fact, I'm out of the will of God if I'm seeking to gain anything personal from a relationship with him while I'm in a temporary place. Even the pursuit of an eternity with him becomes a selfish one that is ungodly if it's sought for my own benefit. If my pursuits in Christ benefit anything other than him, I'm out of alignment with Christ. My goal cannot be to serve or produce anything other than what he calls me to do in my service and produce for the sake of his kingdom. A relationship with Christ is the ultimate polar opposite of serving my own purpose in any form or any fashion that that might take. There are no temporary benefits flowing from the throne of heaven that God intends just to benefit me. Not a single one. If there's any benefit that comes from me serving Christ, it's a fringe benefit that just happens to also be a blessing. But I have to realize I'm not entitled to that. That's just the good fortune that I have because I serve a great God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and put the earth in order. And because I've made myself in alignment with him and attempted in the, to the best of my ability to become holy so that my heart and my mind and my emotions and my spirit are working in connection with him, there may be some benefits, but that's not the goal of the blessing that God pours out on my life. And seeking those blessings is selfish and not the intention of God to pour them out. God wants the kingdom known on the earth. Any good that comes to me by the grace of God in this life is exactly that, a byproduct of grace. It's not a goal and it's not an achievement. I've not earned it. I don't deserve it. And because grace and its intentions are eternal, I would be misleading you and I would be mistaken if I told you to assume that the end purpose of anything that God does in your life is to benefit you while you're on a temporary earth. Your body is temporary, and the needs you have are temporary, and this life is temporary, and God is not interested in reinforcing things that will pass away. The ultimate goal of God's relationship with us then, if my goal in my relationship with him is to serve him, I need to understand the ultimate goal of God in this relationship is to prepare me as a vessel of his spirit in this temporary life so that others can know him and join us together in fellowship in eternity. Mankind, human beings, you, me, the nation of Israel, Adam and Eve, all the way back in the garden, forfeited the opportunity to simply enjoy the benefits of fellowship without consequence when we showed preference for the consequence of sin. When given the opportunity to choose and we chose to do something other than what God said, we forfeited the opportunity to have a consequence-free fellowship with Christ. We may still get to have fellowship with him, in fact, I pray, like I encouraged you this morning in my introduction, before we even turn the camera on, seek him for yourself and have a solid foundation and relationship with him because you need that fellowship. But at the end of the day, eternal fellowship is the goal. God's purpose for you in the temporary is that you be serving his purpose and filled with his spirit and doing the will of God so that others can join you in that fellowship. It's not the kind of fellowship that we get together twice a week and have church. It's not the kind of fellowship where we get together at the coffee shop and we're just Christians out and about. It's not the pastor in the pasture just hanging out with folks, being normal. That's a great way to get people involved. It's a great way to build some relationships, but I need to be bringing people to the knowledge and understanding of the glory and power and grace of God in everything that I do. And if I'm not serving that purpose, if I'm simply chasing the blessings or the greatness or the wonderful or relief from my own stress right now, I'm out of the will of God and I'm not pursuing him with all my heart and I'm not open to God having his way in my life. And that is a dangerous and terrifying place to be as a Christian. Since the Garden of Eden, it's been man's call to labor in this temporary life until the fellowship with Christ could be restored in eternity. 
We have to understand this if we're going to find any peace, find any joy, and find any holiness while we're on this earth. Until we submit with the proper attitude and perspective to our function in the kingdom of God, we will be without these things on the earth. There will be no joy, no holiness, and no peace in your life if you have not completely yielded to God having his way in your life as opposed to you trying to figure out how to make your way fit into the will of God. There is no place for your way in the will of God. He certainly created you with a personality and he certainly created you with likes and dislikes and emotions and feelings and reactions to things. He hardwired that stuff in you. I'm not saying you're not an individual. I'm simply saying I'm not entitled to assert my individuality apart from God. And I'm also not entitled to insert my individuality in God unless God's released me to do it in the context of what he sent me to do in the first place by fulfilling his purpose. Me as an individual matters so little in the kingdom until my individuality is submitted to and given way to God's will in my life. Until then, I'm entitled to nothing. And until then, I have no opportunity to say, but I am. I've told you before how many words containing the word self have suddenly appeared in the English language just since we've been a country in America. It's insane. It's exponentially more words about me now than there were in Greek or in Hebrew or a thousand years ago or even 500 years ago. We've become obsessed with me and self and feel like we're entitled to because I am. And the truth is there's only one I am. And if mine's not submitted to his, I have no voice in the kingdom and can be expected to receive or I can expect to receive nothing from Christ if my I am is suddenly trying to outshine him. So today in this passage, with that as an introduction, I want to look at the first of two examples of submission that we see in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 6 tells the story of a reluctant prophet, a man, a man who was sent by God to endure great difficulty to bring the purpose of God to bear on the earth, even against what he wanted to do, against his individuality, against his personality, in a way that was completely separate from what he thought he should be doing or what seemed natural and comfortable for him. Gideon is who we'll be talking about next week. And this introduction today and the first half of this message today is going to focus on the people that he was sent to save and why he had to go in the first place. We're going to look at the nation of Israel. We have read to you verses 1 through 10 of chapter 6. And verse 1 just says it all. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Does that describe your life? Uh, Be honest. We're family. I mean, it's like that Bernie Sanders meme that they had floating around on the Internet when he was running for president. I'm here again asking for your financial support. I feel like I'm coming before God all the time going, Lord, I am here again asking for you to forgive me because I repent, because I have again chosen evil. I'm not out doing the same evil, wicked things I did last week or last month or 10 years ago or when I was a teenager. But I have, because I am a corrupted, fallible, imperfect human being, found new and creative ways to bring evil into my life. Even as a Christian who loves the Lord and wants more than anything to hear well done, good and faithful servant, if you give me a chance in a weak moment or in an ignorant moment or in a stupid moment or just because it happens to look appealing and I'm acting rashly and I'm not completely at one with the Spirit and don't have the Holy Ghost living in me, I will choose or create the most interesting way to sin that you can imagine. Let me give you an example. It's not that I'm going to run out and hire a prostitute. It's not that I'm going to run out and get drunk. However, Lord, I am really tired this morning, and there was a headline that I saw in my news feed that was more interesting than my devotional. I'll get to that later. I'll spend some time with you at lunch. I don't say that to hurt you, but I'm telling you, I will find an interesting and creative way. To, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even, I'm not saying I won't follow the Lord. I'm not saying I'm not going to pray. I'm just not right now, Lord. Lord, I hear that still small voice, and I'm standing over here singing. 
and I feel like I need to sing that chorus again, and I look out and no one seems to be worshiping with me, so I don't. Now, you may hear those things and think, that's trite, that's small. Oh, look how holy and spiritual he is. His sins are related to not being a good enough Christian. But here's the problem. Sin is sin. And if God has put me in a place to perform a task and do a thing, and I've decided to do something else, even to take the thing he asked me to do and do it later, like Jonah who says, I ain't going. Jonah was disobedient. And he got swallowed by a whale. Yeah. There are tons of stories in the Bible where we find out that delayed obedience is disobedience. I teach my kids that. If I'm not completely submitted and completely giving God his way in any given moment, even by putting God off for five minutes, I have sinned. It's not that I'm so holy. It's that I'm developing a realization the older I get that I don't commit what we call the big sins so much anymore. But there are a thousand little sins that I'll commit today if I'm not completely in alignment with Christ. If it's not his spirit living in me. And so the nation of Israel, again, has has done evil in the sight of the Lord. I'll spare you the translation of all the words. I simply am going to give you the sentence if you take that sentence apart. The way that this would have been understood to someone reading it in Hebrew would sound like this. Again, the Israelites sought pain instead of seeking the Lord. The Israelites sought pain instead of seeking the Lord. Being given the option to do what the Lord said or what they thought was best, the Lord says, it's not just, are you going to follow me or not? It's, are you going to deliberately blaze a trail down to destruction and death? Or will you do what I've asked you to do? Would you like to be grounded for the next 30 days from every screen that there is in this house? Or would you like to take out the garbage and be inconvenienced for a minute and a half? And Israel sought pain instead of seeking God. You cannot and you will not find satisfaction apart from the Lord. You will find pain. You will find hurt. You will find disappointment. You will find any number of things that you may actively be trying to run from in seeking out the thing that you want, but you will not find satisfaction apart from God. I taught this on Wednesday night, so I'm not going to reteach it, but I do want to call it back to your memory. Jeremiah 17, 9. If you break it down and read it the way it's intended, sounds like this. Your personal nature will eventually trap you into hopelessness. Following the footprints of your own desires will lead you into incurable despair. A despair from which there is no saving you. Nothing but a transplant of your spirit will save you from what has befallen you if you follow the footprints of your own desires to their end result. And there's an important item I want you to note here as we go forward with this today. There is a difference a huge difference and a very important difference between despair and desperation or hopelessness. There's a huge difference between being desperate and being hopeless. And we have to be aware of desperation in our lives and in the lives of others. Let me explain to you why. To be desperate means to be reckless and dangerous as the result of an urgent need. I need something. I am hooked on heroin and I'm about to get dope sick and the very the, I've got 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour and if I don't get a needle in my arm, I'm going to be in the most pain in my body that I can possibly imagine. That person is desperate. They will lie to you. They will do anything they can do. They are after one thing, not the greatness of God. They're after another needle in their arm because they're fearful of what's going to happen to them next and they're terrified and they're in despair and desperate. If I don't get this, I know what horrible thing will happen to me. People that are in a hopeless place where they say, if I don't get this by this date, if I don't have this paid by Friday, I'm homeless. If I don't have this particular drug in my system, I'm going to be sick, whether it's an actual sickness or whether it's an addiction. If I don't get married by the time I'm 30, I'm going to be an old woman. There's no hope for me. People become desperate, and the problem with desperation is that it is reckless and dangerous because it will do anything to acquire what it's focused on. 
Hopelessness is completely different. The idea of being hopeless is that I am beyond optimism. I am defeated by the revelation of my own inadequacy. Hopelessness is I realize I can't do it myself. Do you see the difference in the posture of a hopeless person and a desperate person? A desperate person is reckless and violent. A hopeless person simply realizes their own place and has sat down to give up. It's important to know this different because desperate people still have an agenda. They have a goal and they'll do anything to satisfy or achieve it and they'll do it at any cost and at any personal, spiritual, or monetary expense necessary. Apart from God, understanding my nature will leave me hopeless. Apart from God, desperation will make me selfish, reckless, and dangerous. When we find ourselves in a place of desperation, suddenly we find out that turning to God seems simple because it looks like a means to an end. Desperate people look to God and say, I need this so if I'll just get saved. I need this so if I'll just go to the altar. I need this so if I'll repent. I need this so if I'll sing on the worship team. I need this so if I do enough devotions and pray enough, I will suddenly be in a position to receive what I need because I'm desperate. And I don't care if I alienate the pastor or I don't care if it's the pastor's wife or I don't care if it's the people in that church or I don't care if I drain their bank account. I'm not, I don't care about any of that. If I do this as a desperate person, I'll get what I need from God. That's desperation. That's not hopelessness. It's reckless and it's dangerous. We mustn't find ourselves in a place of being desperate, but Israel was in a place of being desperate. They called out to the Lord and said, Lord, we'll do anything. That's not a hopeless person. Someone who will do anything is dangerous. Desperate people will promise to do anything. Desperate people will beg for their lives. Desperate people will lie to you and swear they've never been this broke before and they'll never do it again. Desperate people will promise they'll never have another drink if God will just stop the room spinning and they can quit puking in the floor. Desperate people will promise to pray every day. Desperate people will promise to preach the gospel to the darkest jungle of Africa and all the orphans that are in it. Anything to get out of the pain and the brokenness and the suffering that they find themselves in, but those promises all have an agenda and God's not interested in your selfish agenda. God's interested in having you say, Lord, have your way, not mine. In spite of my pain and my frustration and my loss and my hurt, God, do what you need to do. Don't worry about my needs. Eternity will cover those. In the case of Israel, they really were like someone who was dope sick. Dope sick. Battling addiction. I'll do anything for the $5, the $8. Ask me how I know it costs $8 for a hit. Let me tell you how many people I know that have struggled with heroin addiction, even in my own family, and told me the things that they were willing to do for $8 some days because they were desperate. Anything to get relief from the consequence of my most recent bad choice so I can buy some time until I get an opportunity to make the next bad choice. That's where Israel is at. And that's where many of us find ourselves as Christians because we have again chosen pain. The Lord says, I need you to have my way, not yours. Will you ask for my way? And then here's a really sad, disgusting truth. One that I argued with God about sharing with you this morning, but I couldn't get away from it. The church has been preying on and taking advantage of desperate people for years. We've sought them out for quick conversions. We've sought them out so we could get their dramatic testimony on our website or on our platform or in our conference. And we've held up their experience as some kind of a rallying symbol for people to come to Christ. And we failed to disciple them. And we have felt sorry for ourselves because we get taken advantage of by that person at the end of the day. We felt sorry for ourselves. And we felt bad. And we shake, our, we shake our heads and smack ourselves in the face. And we say, what happened? Why did they backslide? Why did they relapse? Why did they prove to be dishonest all along? And the problem is the church is just as desperate sometimes to try and put up good numbers for their conversions and their salvations and their help and their, their charity and their outreach as that person was desperate to get what they needed from the church. 
Desperate people are dangerous and a church that will behave desperately to help the desperate is just as dangerous as that person. When Jesus speaks to the disciples in the parables about the kingdom, when we look at Matthew, he talks about separating the tares from the wheat and the good fish from the fat, from the bad. Jesus is talking to the church and to the Christians. He's not talking about separating sinners from saints. He's looking at the church and saying, some of you are doing it wrong. And at the end of time, I'm going to separate who did it right from who didn't. He was speaking not about separating the world from the people of God. He was talking about sifting out the evil practices even in the very early church that was beginning to form around his ministry. We see it again in Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 when he talks about a church that appears to be outwardly holy but misuses its power. This is what he's talking about. A church that isn't prepared for the age in which it lives and becomes desperate to simply look like they're doing something great for the kingdom. He's talking about Christians who become desperate in their faith rather than acknowledging their hopelessness and aligning with the will of God. A church that's misdirected and unaware is who we're talking about. Not a church that's openly, visibly, deliberately evil. Not a church that suddenly takes down the cross and puts down a pentagram, puts up a pentagram instead. Not a church that's out deliberately performing wickedness, but a church that has lost its way because it's not spirit-filled anymore, and it's suddenly driven by the work of God and the benefits that come from the relationship with Him. That's a church that's misdirected that's unaware that they're not submitted to and serving the purpose of God. That's a Christian that doesn't know what it means for God to have his way. Desperation is always selfish and always dangerous. And a church that will prey upon the desperate in the name of Christ is just as desperate and just as dangerous as those it will take advantage of for its own purposes. Desperation cannot, does not, and will not produce disciples according to the purpose of Christ. If you come to Christ in desperation, until you trade your desperation for hopelessness, there will be no relationship or no relief for you. Because there is no discipleship until you will trade the idea of desperation for the idea of hopelessness. You want to ask why I've done everything I feel like I'm supposed to do and God still isn't blessing me? Where's your awareness of who you are in Christ? Have you begun to think, I am, I should, I've done? We have to trade desperation for hopelessness. I'm not adequate. I can't. I'm not able. Lord, will you? It's very different than the man who comes saying, Lord, I'll do anything. Lord, I can't. Will you? Lord, have your way. That's the heart of a person that can be discipled. That's the heart of a person that can be taught. That's the heart of a person that can be drawn close to Christ and become effective for the kingdom, that can fulfill that purpose, that yes, eternally I'll be in fellowship, but while I'm here, I should be serving the purpose of God because it's his will, not mine. Those individuals and those organizations that only preach about the good of God and what he can do for you, The ones that are focused upon a message of rescue are preaching a desperate and dangerous gospel. And if we believe that like attracts like, then that message can only attract desperate and dangerous people. And we wonder why the church, when it began preaching prosperity and your best life, quickly became one of the most disrespected organizations in America. I want to tell you something this morning. My God is not desperate. My God and your God and the God of the universe is not desperate. And performing his work is not an act of desperation. It cannot and must not become something we do desperately. It's something we do as servants who love him and are submitted to him and his spirit. I can't just go out and try to grow a church because I have to fill it up because the state office said so or the other pastors say we should have 200 people in year three. I'd rather have 10 disciples in this building doing the work of Christ 
than have 10,000 people showing up in an auditorium who are anonymous and unaccountable for their relationship with God. And at the end of the day, he looks at 9,500 of them and says, I don't know you. I'm not justifying being small. What I'm justifying is the fact that we have got to be in a place where we can build disciples, and I refuse to desperately go seek the desperate for the sake of how it looks on the outside, the church that looks good but has misused its power. We won't be that here, and I won't be that as a man. I pray that you won't be that as a Christian and a follower of Christ. The difference between desperate people and hopeless people, the difference between the ministry of the desperate and the ministry of the hopeless is this. Jesus sought to bring hope to the hopeless, not draw conversion experiences out of desperate people. The message of the gospel is one of hope and one of submission and one of servanthood and in pursuit of fellowship. That's something we've got to understand, whether we're in the faith or whether we're in this world, whether you're in the church or whether you're in the job, if you're out just with your friends or if you're at home with your family members and closest folks to you. We have to understand seeking to assert my own will will always lead me to a place of poverty and imprisonment. Apart from a state of full submission to God, I will find myself deficient in spirit, in mind, in emotion, and in relationship. Holiness becomes impossible when my will is what's driving the bus. Apart from a state of full submission to God, you're going to find yourself enslaved to a natural human means of temporary satisfaction. You will find yourself trapped in a cycle of barely having enough of these few momentary comforts to sustain you until the next hit of pain comes along. Because God's going to allow the consequences of your actions to be visited on you. And when I've again found myself in a place of evil and I've again chosen pain, sometimes that simply means I've chosen not full submission to Christ, only partial submission. And if I'm only partially submitted, I'm fully in sin and the consequences of sin will come for me. And that momentary comfort only lasts for a moment because that's what I've signed up for. And the pain is coming back to get me because that's the consequence. I'll find myself in that cycle wanting the next craving to be satisfied, the next loss that's going to hit that I'm going to have to beg for help for. The next evidence of lack and loss is going to come up and torment me because I've chosen pain like Israel did. I chose to suffer instead of choosing Christ because I only chose part of God's will and way. There are four areas. If they sound familiar to you, it's because we started talking about them last week and I didn't realize I was going to be talking about them so much when God gave them to me for the last message. Personality, power, perspective, and personal relationship. Those four areas are all places where submission to him is designed to complete us. We will be incomplete in those areas apart from being submitted to God. These aspects of God's character are designed to replace our own. If I'm functioning even partially out of the will of God, I'm functioning fully in my own will. And these four things that his Holy Spirit provides, I have no access to them. And you say, well, okay, I thought we were preaching out of the Old Testament. You talked about the Holy Spirit last week, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit now and what he does when he replaces it. Yes, that's the vehicle he uses it for now. God, throughout history, even before the Holy Spirit, has made this kind of completion and this idea of holiness possible. Look at the history with me. In the Old Testament, God accomplished this by his own hand. God was the connection to the people. God gave the priests and the church, and he gave a structure by which people would be in relationship with him. And it was hard, and it was difficult, and there were tons and tons of laws in this old part of the book that we read. But at the end of the day... The purpose of this was to say, you are made holy. Your personality and your perspective and your power, all these things are aligned with me because you've done these actions by the law. It's always been God's goal. In the Gospels, he accomplished this through the very person of Jesus being present with his people. Jesus was here in this transitional dispensation of grace as he was made a human upon the earth. Today, after the resurrection, this is accomplished by the Holy Spirit the way we taught last week. The person of God is present in your life today. That's the way God seeks to fulfill these things. But it's always been his desire. And we find Israel here in the book of Judges in need of the Spirit of the Lord. They need his power because they can't deliver themselves. They need his perspective. They're hungry. They're starving. They're without their basic needs because they've chosen evil and the consequences of that evil has come upon them, but they've become desperate and not hopeless. Lord will do anything. 
And that attitude put them in slavery yet again. Their desperation drove them into caves, into places of loss and of lack. And in the modern church and our everyday life, desperation and selfish Christianity has driven us out of favor in the culture that we live in and out of power in the world that we were sent to disciple. Why does no one listen? Well, because we only submitted to part of the word when he sent us. We have got to get to a place where we are saying, Lord, have your way completely in me. We like those phrases, whatever it costs. Anything it costs me, Lord. Anything that costs me nothing is... We have some wonderful scriptures we quote. We have some great songs we sing about this. But at the end of the day... I'll pray at lunch. At the end of the day, this isn't really sin, is it, Lord? I mean, there's nobody here to see it. The reason it's sinful is because it would be a bad example for someone to see me do that. But if it's just me and you, this is all right, right, Lord? Isn't that okay? That's not a problem, is it, Jesus? At the end of the day, are we fully submitted? The partial submission of Israel to the will of God was not enough to sustain them even when they reached the promised land, even when they arrived where God wanted them to be, to give them what he wanted to give them, to dispense his heart's desire at the end of the day, partial submission wasn't enough to sustain it, and they found themselves again in slavery. Luke 14, 28 speaks about counting the cost. We can't be found guilty of only partially committing to Christ. I talked to you last week about the rational spiritual perspective that comes from the Holy Spirit. We can't ask God to have his way out of desperation. We've got to ask to be discipled out of our hopelessness. We can't pray the prayers of desperate people. We can't become reckless and dangerous prayers. People who seek to serve and satisfy ourselves with relief or reward ourselves with deliverance from self-inflicted consequences. At the end of the day, let's not find ourselves as Christians who have sought pain instead of pleasing the Lord. Let's not find ourselves begging for the deliverance from the consequences that we've brought upon ourselves, even within the boundaries of our own faith and relationship with him. This morning, if you'll stand with me, I want to close with this. If you would close your eyes and bow your head with me today. I want to make a couple of statements and I want to ask you a question. The statements first, we've got to pray with a spiritual perspective and with the understanding that God having his way means all of his way and not mine. If I'm coming to the throne of God to pray, if I'm coming to offer myself to his service, if I'm coming to accept his call, if I'm coming to receive something from him, I have to ask myself, am I coming selfishly because of my own need and my desperation, or am I coming because he's offered it to me as a disciple who needs it to further his purpose on the earth? Partial submission to the will of God and submitting only for the benefit of ourselves or our church or our cause is equal to the complete rejection of him. It leaves us unfit and unwilling and unable to fulfill his purpose. In order to enter into a genuine, healthy, and complete relationship with Christ, we have to do so on his terms, understanding and accepting the full scope of what it means for God to have his way with us. I make those statements so I can ask you this question. When you look at your own life, when you look at your relationship with the Lord, when you examine yourself this morning with your head bowed and your eyes closed and focused entirely upon your connection to the God of the universe, how much of that relationship is based upon what I can get from God because I'm desperate? How many times have I come and asked or have I built a foundation upon the idea of, Lord, if you'll do for me, Lord, I need, Lord, I've got to have. Lord, there's no other place I can get and I won't make it if. Because if you claim to be in relationship with him and any portion of your relationship is built on that, that portion of your faith is going to crumble when something comes and strains against it. When the enemy comes, that's the part of you that is likely to do anything and latch on to the evil that we will choose again. 
the part of my relationship with him that's not founded upon being hopeless and willing to be discipled and that has said, Lord, have your way. The part where I've come with my way in mind is what's going to crumble next. This morning, I want to pray with you.